Okay, so today we're going to talk about skeletal muscle physiology. I'm going to cover the structure and then I want to go over the neuromuscular junction and then actual contraction. And um, in the second PowerPoint, we're going to talk about um, skeletal muscles sort of contracting as a whole. Okay, so what are the functions of skeletal muscle? Um, it's to produce movement, obviously. That's the main one that you're used to. Um, maintain body position. Support soft tissues, right? Guard openings like your mouth, your eyes. Uh, maintain body temperature and store nutrient reserves. Can you tell me which nutrient skeletal muscle stores? Good, that's glycogen. So here's uh, pictures of skeletal muscle, cardiac, and smooth muscle. So notice skeletal muscles on the top. Um, this is a muscle fiber, so muscle fiber is one cell. It's striated and it has many nuclei per cell. Uh, and when you look at it under the microscope, like you did in anatomy, you'll see those striations. Um, the striations mean that the actin and myosin are in parallel arrangement or the contractile fibers are in parallel arrangement. Cardiac muscle, a little bit different, right? Cardiac muscle, you have the cardiac muscle. Um, again, you still see the striations. Uh, so the actin and myosin is in parallel arrangement. Um, and you have these intercalated discs that hold those cardiac cells together. And so here's some cardiac cells. They're branching one to two nuclei per cell. Um, and they have those triations. Smooth muscle still has actin and myosin, but it's spindle shaped. It's not arranged in a parallel fashion. Um, so it's different. You don't see it under the microscope. Um, cardiac and smooth muscle both have the ability to uh, stretch and contract. So cardiac muscle contracts maybe about a third of what it possibly can contract and smooth muscle stretches and uh, contracts about an eighth of what it can norm it, it can uh, contract and so these guys are really contractile. Um, here's a picture of uh, hemoglobin for the red blood cells and myoglobin for the skeletal muscle. Myoglobin um, is specific to skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue and it is a protein that binds oxygen uh, better than hemoglobin does. So when the blood flows over the skeletal muscle or when the blood vessel flows through the skeletal muscle, the oxygen is pulled to myoglobin. Um, when these tissues are damaged, the myoglobin actually is released into the blood. And so you can infer how much damage happens with the skeletal muscle or as in like a heart attack, the cardiac muscle, because they're gonna leak enzymes, they're gonna leak myoglobin, and they're gonna leak uh, troponin, which is a contractile fiber into the bloodstream, and you can measure that. Here's a plot of myoglobin. So up in the top, there's myoglobin. Myoglobin is a single subunit. Um, and then hemoglobin is to the right of that. And then, <laughs> then you have the, um, percent of oxygen saturation for myoglobin and then amount of oxygen, right? Notice that if um, oxygen is there, myoglobin is going to bind it. So it's really fast. Notice again for hemoglobin, what do you see? It takes a little bit of oxygen for hemoglobin to bind oxygen. And then once it does, the second, third, and fourth one jump onto that hemoglobin and then it becomes saturated. This is something you should have covered in anatomy, but let's review a little bit. So skeletal muscle, uh, let's say this is your biceps brachii, okay? This is an organ. So that whole skeletal muscle, your whole biceps brachii is considered the organ. If you look at the bundles, these are actually called uh, muscle fascicles. And if you pull out one fascicle, uh, one fascicle is made up of a bundle of muscle fibers, and then one fiber, uh, which is considered a cell, right? Muscle fiber, this would be a muscle cell. Um, if you look at it, it has thousands of myofibrils in it. Those myofibrils are made up of actin and myosin, and those are the contractile units. So again, here's a muscle fiber, right? Um, and if we look at it, you notice that it has hundreds of myofibrils or thousands of myofibrils in it. Um, it also has some mitochondria, right? You know that these guys need a lot of ATP to contract. 
um, and then it has a lot of nuclei on the outside. Whenever a cell has a lot of nuclei, it means that it's going to do a lot of protein upregulation. So it's going to be making proteins, um, repairing cells, et cetera, et cetera. And so that should make sense with skeletal muscle, always needing to contract to provide movement. Um, let's take a look on the bottom picture. So the uh, sarcoplasm is the plasma membrane that surrounds the muscle cell, right? And then you have these holes. These are, uh, that was my dog. <laughs> my dog and cat are chasing each other around the house. <laughs> Sorry. So you have these little holes. Um, these holes actually lead to the, uh, um, the T tubules, right? So um, let's say the impulse, let's say the nerve is connected right here to the skeletal muscle. Um, this area is going to depolarize and then it's going to spread through the sarcoplasm until it hits the um, T tubule. And then the yellow portion is all the T tubules. So the T tubule is what takes the impulse from the surface down deep into where those contractile fibers are. Right. Um, notice that the T tubule is smacked up right against the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is blue in this picture. Um, it holds a calcium, and so you get the impulse or charge going deep into the muscles, and then it's uh, going to ultimately cause this sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into the contractile fiber area. And you see these contractile fibers. Um, here's your myofibril. This whole thing is called a myofibril. And then you have a thin filament, which are the red ones, and then the purple ones are the thick filaments. So um, for contraction, you have to take that impulse from the surface down deep until you get to the contractile cells. Okay, so here is your uh, T tubule your sarcoplasmic reticulum, and they are surrounding a myofibril. So if you look at that myofibril, it's repeating patterns of actin and myosin. So it's repeating patterns of sarcomeres. Um, a sarcomere is from Z-line to Z-line. This you may have learned in anatomy, you might not have, um, but a sarcomere is the smallest functional unit of skeletal muscle, or it's the smallest contractile unit of skeletal muscle. Um, the sarcomere, by definition, is from Z-line to Z-line. Um, notice that the Z-line is actin, so if you draw it out, um, the Z-line is actin, or that's where actin anchors to. Um, the red is all actin, right? So it's the, sm the small filament. And then the um, M-line, is the anchor for the myosin and so uh, myosin or the purple line so myosin uh, comes off of the m line and actin comes off of the z line now notice and those are the two contractile fibers so notice that when um notice that there are other bands right so let's look at the i band um the i band is actin only right so it's where there's only actin the a band is wherever there's myosin so wherever there's myosin is where the A-band is. Um, and then the H-band is myosin only. And then the M-line is what anchors the myosin. And so when these guys contract or when the sarcomeres contract, the actin is actually going to walk along, or the myosin is going to walk along the actin or pull the actin towards the M-line. And so the H-band and the I-band are going to shorten. Here's a um, transmission electron micrograph. It's uh, of a sarcomere and it's magnified 64,000 times. And so you get these beautiful striations. These beautiful striations are because the actin and myosin um, bundles are arranged sort of like checkers, like they're stacked up one against uh, one on top of the other. So here's your Z line. Uh, the light is the actin because it's a thin. Uh, molecular thin protein and so it doesn't absorb a lot of light so light goes through it so it looks lighter um, and then the a band is um, where there's myosin and myosin is considered to be the thicker filament um, and so it absorbs more light and so you see this repeating pattern of 
light and dark and light and dark, and that is what we see as striations under the microscope. Um, the cyto contraction. So if you tease these guys out, uh, the myofibril, and tease them out until you get to the contraction filaments uh, at the bottom of the page, on the left is a myosin molecule. So there's a myosin tail, there's a hinge region, and then there's a head. Notice that there's two heads. So it's kind of like a golf club, or if you had two golf clubs twisted around each other, um, that is what a myosin uh, molecule looks like. Then we have the actin. The actin actually looks like a chain of pearls. So if you take pearl necklace, you pull it taut and you twist it, it actually looks like how actin looks. So this is a beaded complex of proteins. It's a chain of proteins and then you have a couple of other proteins attached to it. Um, we can skip that or actually no. Take a look at the M line or the uh, where the anchor of the myosin are. So here's your myosin uh, molecule, and the myosin molecules are arranged like a bunch of golf clubs in a golf bag. They're kind of um, spiral or twisted, right? So all the heads are wrapped around um, and they're facing out. And so these are all the myosin heads. These are what are going to grab onto the actin and they are going to contract and pull the actin towards them. So they act kind of like claws, if you will. Um, pulling the actin towards the M line. So if you zoom in closer, uh, notice that the tip of the myosin heads are the actin binding site, and then uh, where ATP binds, because we have to have ATP to get these guys excited or transfer energy, right, so that they can contract, um, there's ATP binding sites. And so there's two ATP binding sites because we have two heads. So um, that means that we need two ATP. Again, here's an electron micrograph of a sarcomere. So it shows the thick filament, the thin filament, and um, the cross bridging occurring. Okay, let's take a look at the thin filament. So the thin filament is actin. So notice that these are beads or globular proteins of actin. It's called G actin. Um, the black spot is where the myosin head binds. Okay, so it's a double helical actin strand. So there's one uh, helix and then there's another helix. Um, and notice that the black dots are where myosin binds. Um, and also notice that we have another uh, sheath protein covering this. So tropomyosin uh, sits on those binding sites, those myosin binding sites so that myosin can't bind. Um, and then there's a three-beaded complex called troponin that's uh, stuck to the tropomyosin. So it's not just actin for the thin uh, filament. Um, it's actin and the tropomyosin and the troponin that are involved with uh, contraction and relaxation. Take a look at what happens. So here at the top, A is in the relaxed state. Um, when the muscle is relaxed, Tropomyosin is covering those myosin binding sites or those active sites um, so that uh, myosin can't get to them, right? It's kind of like, it looks like licorice, if you will. So licorice is covering those sites so that the myosin head can't bind there, okay? But look at what happens when you add calcium. So when you add calcium, um, which comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, when you add calcium, calcium binds to what? Good, it binds to troponin. Troponin is that three bead complex. And when it does that, it causes tropomyosin to move out of these binding sites, right? So now that tropomyosin's out of the way, can myosin bind to actin? Yes, it can. Okay, so what do we have to have in order for myosin to bind to actin? You have to have calcium, okay? So that's one of the molecules you have to have. Calcium has to bind here in order to get. Um, uh, troponin to move tropomyosin out of the myosin binding sites for or on actin. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at how actually excitation occurs. So in the histological slide to your right, um, there is a nerve and notice how there's a lot of axon terminal regions. 
and they're connected or synapsing with a bunch of muscle fibers. Okay, so this is a motor unit. A motor unit is one motor nerve and all of the muscle fibers it innervates. Um, if you looked at where that nerve, um, the axon terminal region connects to the muscle fiber, we call that the neuromuscular junction. And so here's a picture of it. So here's a motor nerve, and then below that is the muscle. Okay, so how do we get um, the motor nerve excited, right? How do we get an action potential generated down the axon? Is it sodium or calcium? So if we're talking about the axon, it's actually going to be sodium. So sodium voltage-gated channels pop open, sodium rushes in, right? Sodium voltage-gated channels pop open, sodium rushes in, sodium voltage-gated channels pop open, sodium rushes in. Okay, and then what depolarizes the axon terminal? Okay, so it's calcium. So if you look at number two, calcium voltage-gated channels pop open and calcium rushes in. And then that causes these vesicles containing neurotransmitters to dump their neurotransmitters into the synapse, right? So number three, the neurotransmitter is getting excitosed into the synapse. Um, what happens then? This, we've seen this before. We've talked about this, or I've talked about this when we covered nerve to nerve uh, communication. So now this is nerve to skeletal muscle. Um, you know the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, right? And then what receptor type is it gonna bind to? it's gonna be the same as the nerve to nerve. So it's acetylcholine binding to nicotinic cholinergic receptors, right? So acetylcholine is gonna to bind to those nicotinic cholinergic receptors and um, cause, uh, let me see, let's do an arrow, and cause, so if you can see that, it's gonna to bind to the receptors and cause this receptor to pop open. So if acetylcholine binds to the receptor and causes the, the gate to pop, pop open, it's considered to be a ligand gated channel, okay? So number five, uh, acetylcholine binds to the receptor, pops open this channel, and sodium's gonna rush in. Okay, what happens when sodium rushes in? It's going to spread, uh, you're gonna hit, first of all, you're gonna hit threshold, and then it's gonna spread on down the line um, and generate an action potential, right? So this region, this whole region, is called um, the motor end plate. So the neuromuscular junction is where the nerve uh, binds to the skeletal muscle. Um, the skeletal muscle at the region of the motor end plate has a lot of nicotinic cholinergic receptors, right? So that they can depolarize and propagate an action potential. Okay, um, so take a look at number four. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what neurotransmitter is released from the neuron? Good, that's acetylcholine. And what receptor type does it bind to? Okay, it's going to bind to nicotinic cholinergic receptors. And when it does that, it's going to pop open this channel. Sodium is going to rush in and depolarize the motor end plate. And then that's going to spread down the sarcoplasmic, uh, the sarcolemma. Excuse me. Um, and ultimately cause action potential and contraction. Um, but there are a couple of things that I want to remind you of. When acetylcholine binds, it's transient. So acetylcholine binds, pops open the channel, releases, binds, pops open the channel, releases, binds, pop open the channel, releases. As long as the acetylcholine is in the synapse, it's going to keep binding and popping open these receptors. Um, how do we get this whole thing to shut off? First, the nerve has to stop releasing acetylcholine. So the nerve has to stop getting excited, right? And then once it stops releasing acetylcholine, whatever acetylcholine is in the synapse is stuck there, all right? How do we get rid of the acetylcholine in the synapse? Take a look at these little blue guys embedded in the membrane. So these are called acetylcholine esterase um, enzymes. They break down acetylcholine. So as soon as acetylcholine hits these acetylcholine esterase enzymes, it's going to get degraded. So take a look at the left. So here is uh, the name of it, acetylcholine esterase. So acetylcholine esterase is right here. Um, that breaks down acetylcholine. Okay, so the impulse has to stop at the nerve. 
then the nerve stops releasing acetylcholine and whatever acetylcholine is in the synapse has to get broken down by the acetylcholine esterase. Um, and once the acetylcholine is broken down, then these uh, nicotinic cholinergic receptors shut and the impulse stops. All right, so let's take a look. So let's go back to contraction. So, and this is numbered for you. So acetylcholine, let's start at number one, gets released from the nerve. Uh, it binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors and causes an action potential at the motor end plate. That action potential is gonna spread down the line. So there's number two. It's gonna spread in deep through the T-tubules. So the T-tubules allow that impulse to go from the surface into the, um, where the contractile fibers are. Notice that there's a DHP receptor. So this is called dihydropyridine, um, but we call it DHP for short. So uh, that action potential is gonna spread down and when it hits that DHP receptor, that DHP receptor gets excited and this uh, coil contracts and this little hatch door opens. So it kind of reminds me of a video game, right? Like a Super Mario's game, um, like Super Mario Brothers or Mario's gonna hit the coin box and then that's gonna excite this and the hatch door is gonna release calcium, okay? So this is a fancy way of how we get calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to bind to um, the troponin to get the tropomyosin out of the way and get contraction started. Okay, so take a look at the next picture. So the action potential, so we're at three, the action potential goes down the T-tubule, hits the DHP receptor, that gets excited, it causes the uh, port to open or the door to open, um, and then calcium rushes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and we're at number five. Calcium is going to bind to what? Is it troponin or tropomyosin? Good. Calcium is going to bind to troponin, and it's going to move that tropomyosin out of the way. Once tropomyosin is out of the way, myosin can then bind to the uh, actin. And once myosin binds to actin, then it contracts and pulls the actin towards the M line. Okay, and so look at number seven. So you get that... Um, this is a distance that actin moves. Um, the actin is going to move towards the M line. Okay, so power stroke, movement of myosin cross bridges, pushes actin towards the center of the sarcomere. End of the power stroke, myosin releases that actin and grabs another actin. Um, and the cycle keeps repeating. You have to remember though, think of, um, if you think of spiders, like spider legs, how um, you know all of them are touching the ground at the same time. They always have, you know, two. They always have uh, three to four legs touching the ground, um, but then they can pick up a couple of them and move. Um, it's the same thing with these. So the myosin heads are going to grab onto the actin, and they're going to contract um, and pull the actin towards the M line, towards the middle. Uh, but it's asynchronous, so they're contracting at uh, different times. Okay, so let's take a look. So um, what binds to troponin to move tropomyosin out of the way? Good, so calcium's released. It binds to troponin, moves tropomyosin out of the way, so that actin can bind to myosin, right? Um, once that sorry, once that myosin is bound to actin, then it can start contracting, okay? Um, and we call that a power stroke. So when it contracts, we call that a power stroke. Um, and then at the end, uh, in order to initiate the power stroke, the phosphate has to leave, right? So make yourself a note for number four, to get that power stroke or contraction, phosphate has to leave. That's what initiates contraction, okay? So here's the sliding filament theory. We're going to start at number one. Um, notice that we're going to start after it just finished contraction. So kind of weird, but um, the myosin head is bound to the actin, okay? Um, we call this a rigor state. Uh, what releases the myosin to, from the actin? ATP has to bind. So ATP binds and releases the myosin from the actin. If there is no ATP, the myosin stay stuck to the actin, okay? So that's what happens, uh, that's what we call rigor mortis. So when a person's dead, are they making ATP? No, they're not. So if they don't have ATP, then the myosin's stuck to the actin. 
That also happens with cramps, right? You run out of ATP and the myosin is still bound to the actin because you need ATP to release it. All right, so number two, ATP binds to the myosin heads and it releases them from the actin. So you have to have ATP bind in order to get the myosin released from the actin. Okay, once the ATP is bound, it's going to split into ADP and phosphate. Once that happens, that activates the head. So that energy transfers to the head. So the head is ready to do a power stroke. So we're at number four. Okay, so notice how the head is activated. Um, and it will bind to uh, actin if calcium is present. Okay, so if calcium is present, myosin binds to actin. And then how do we get that power stroke? So we're at number five. Thank you. So how do we get that power stroke? Um, the phosphate leaves and that initiates the power stroke. And then at the end, the ADP leaves, okay? And then we're stuck. We're stuck with the myosin bound to actin. How do we get the myosin to be released from actin? Good, another ATP has to bind, okay? Then ATP splits, so we're at number three. ATP splits into ADP and phosphate and activates the head, number four. Um, that head will stay activated um, and it won't contract unless calcium is present. So notice how I have calcium up here. You have to have calcium to reveal those active sites on actin for myosin, okay? So then myosin is going to bind to the actin and then the phosphate leaves, you get the power stroke and then the ADP leaves and you're stuck in the rigor state, okay? I want you to practice this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, explaining it to people, drawing it out. Um, there are some major players. The major players are ATP, uh, calcium, okay? And so you need ATP to break the cross bridge from, uh, sorry, the myosin from the actin, and you need the ATP to excite the head, right? The myosin heads uh, to perform a power stroke. Um, and then when the phosphate leaves is when you actually get the power stroke. Um, another player is calcium. You have to have calcium in order to uh, allow myosin to bind to actin, right? The, the tropomyosin and troponin are covering the active sites um, on the actin unless calcium is present. So you need to practice this a couple of times. Okay. So um, asynchronous cycling is what I was trying to talk about earlier. So the muscle cell continuously generates force during contraction. How does it do that? The cross bridging. So the myosin grabbing onto the actin um, is out of phase, right? So you have one myosin grabbing onto the actin, then another myosin grabbing as the first one's letting go. Um, and so you never break complete contact, contact between the thick and fil thin filaments. Okay, take a look. So the top uh, picture is at, what is it? It's at rest. Um, notice here's your, Z line, right? Here's your other Z line. Um, the I band is actin only. The H, uh, the M line would be where the myosin is. The H zone is myosin only. Then the um, the A is wherever myosin is, <laughs> including the overlap. Um, how do I remember the sequence? If you think of Xiam, so look on the review sheet. If you think of Xiam, Z I A H M. So Z I, A, H, M. And that will give you the order of the different uh, bands and zones. Take a look at when the myosin contracts. So the myosin contracts, if you look at the middle, myosin contracts, and but it's not going anywhere because it's stuck. Um, and so it's going to pull the actin towards the M line. And so the actin actually moves in. And so um, the sarcomere shortens, um, the H zone shortens, the I band shortens. Okay, so this is at rest, this is contracted, rest, contracted, rest, contracted. Okay, um, what dictates this? ATP and calcium, good. Uh, and here's another picture, right? So what stops muscle contraction? So first you have to have this nerve shut off so the brain has to tell the nerve, okay, we're done, we're good. Um, and then it stops getting excited. Number two, because it stops getting excited, the calcium voltage gated channels close. 
Um, and then the number three, the vesicle containing acetylcholine stops dumping acetylcholine in the synapse. And if there's not, um, and so whatever acetylcholine is in the synapse has to get degraded by the uh, enzyme, the acetylcholine esterase, right? So ultimately it is the nerve shutting down. Uh, and then, so it doesn't release more acetylcholine and whatever acetylcholine is present is degraded by the acetylcholine esterase. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. So I want you to know the steps for contracting a muscle and for relaxation for a muscle. So um, contraction, you know, you have to get that nerve, um, the skeletal muscle excited. Then you have to take it in uh, deep to the contractile filaments. Calcium's release that ultimately causes contraction. How do you get relaxation? Um, this nerve shuts off. Whatever acetylcholine is in the synapse is broken down by ACHE. We call that acetylcholine esterase. So we abbreviate ACHE. Um, so acetylcholine is degraded, then the impulse stops. Calcium isn't released anymore, and calcium, in fact, is uh, brought back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then um, the active sites are covered by the troponin, um, tropomyosin complex, right? And so the myosin can't engage in the actin. Okay, so for a muscle contraction to occur, what molecules do we have to have? Okay, we have to have ATP and we have to have um, calcium. What do we need for relaxation? Okay, for relaxation, we need ATP as well, right? ATP has to release that cross bridge. Um, rigor mortis, a sniff, stiffness of muscles after death for 72 hours, right? What causes that? If there's no ATP, the actin um, or the myosin can't release the actin. It's so, excuse me, they're stuck together until the proteins start degrading. Um, for your homework, look up the following drugs and conditions and what they do and where they come from. So I want you to tell me what these guys affect. Um, and I'll put up a discussion board um, in Canvas and you guys can share your thoughts. I want you to be specific with what um, receptor they bind to, um, what is their effect on the receptor, and what is their effect as far as contraction and relaxation. Okay, um, next week you have your exam, so I want you guys to uh, go through your review sheet and study. Uh, the exam will be all multiple choice. And so um, I've taken out the essay questions, so that should help. Um, I don't know how many questions it is yet, um, but you'll have an hour and a half to do it. And uh, email me or come to my virtual office hours tomorrow between 10 and 1. Otherwise, have a great weekend, you guys, and stay healthy.